I think we came in at 1 0 half time and so Alex went mad, hair dryer in my face. You're off. I thought my world's over, life's over. We're never going to play football again. Yeah. Because imagine we all watched it at home, that Chelsea game, and I don't know. It wouldn't have been the same. And then you come in the next morning, the training ground, like, oh my God, like, no. But thankfully, Jamie sent out a text to everyone and. Um, you know, a Jamie Vardy party as it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two one down, minute to go. Schluck gets a penalty, and Leo Ajoa puts it away. Two two, and that's when I felt like, yeah, this is this is this is this is our time now. Even you know that is, I think we've won it. He wanted to play Champions League. He was getting dropped. I got dropped for a Champions League, the first Champions League game. I'm fuming. He played. He played Luis Hernandez. I'm sat there thinking, well, I've just, you know, spent all last season, you know, working my socks off to play in the Champions League. First Champions League game, I ain't playing. Mm. You know, the Jamie Carragher thing, to be fair, was a bit of banner. Um, <laughs> mine, he says I'm the worst one. Well, at least I still got that medal. Do you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> <laughs> and this little man, Ricardo, who we're friends with. <laughs> what a player. I'm looking at him, I'm thinking. Mm, it's a bit political still. <laughs> <laughs>Welcome back to the Beautiful Game podcast. It's not every day that you get to speak to, you know, a Premier League champion. So when this one was confirmed, ah, oh, I was cartwheeling in the living room, bro. <laughs> it's mad, it's mad. It's yeah, mad. so without further ado, you know, I'm going to introduce our guest. Currently at Huddersfield, a Premier League champion. He's had spells at Sunderland, Newcastle, Ipswich, even gone abroad to, you know, Royal Antwerp and playing for the famous Manchester United. Welcome to the podcast, Danny Simpson. Exactly. Welcome, 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 Thanks welcome. On, bro. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, we're blessed. We're trying um... to get you on for a minute, but obviously we're yeah. happy to finally get it done. Yeah, yeah. Now, today's my day off, innit, from obviously everyone back at training now. So, um, yeah, so obviously today was um, our rest day. Mm. Um, which was needed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I said there's no problem to come on today. So, just to, you know, we're talking about Huddersfield now. So, just to kick things off, are you happy to return to football? To be honest, I am like, you know, it's, you know, we miss football. And, but again, like everyone, like other people are saying, it's, it's obviously we were anxious. I think it was more about, through the through the couple of months, it was more about not knowing and not knowing, and, and things getting put back and put back, and you know having to train alone. And it was more about like we're used to routine, mm. um, literally from leaving school to you know if you make it to the first team or whatever team, it's oh we've got this game this week, this is just this week. That's your day off. You know we're travelling on this day. Um, even even when it comes down to like your summer holidays, you get six weeks off and everyone will plan, I'm going to go there this week, a few days here, there that week. Um, and it's literally, we're not used to just not doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, I think for me, it was just a bit, of, uh, a bit of anxiety of not knowing, you know, the day we're back in, how it's going to work. Um, to be honest, since since uh, we've gone back, it's, it's worked perfect. And, um, you know, it's good to see all the boys again and um, only training in groups of five at the moment. But like I said, it's it's good to get working with, with the lads instead of obviously just doing stuff on your own, which we were getting told to do. Yeah, so how has this period, you know, been for you? Because we've seen a lot of players come out recently. Troy Deeney has come out and said that he doesn't feel it's appropriate to go back to training, even though as we stand, he's saying that he'll be going back to training next week. N'Golo Kante is another one that said that there's a major risk to BAME and I think he's already got a pre-existing condition which he feels, you know, this COVID will have an impact on. Have you been reticent to go back to training or are you just happy to be part of the group again? Um, no, listen, I, I understand, you know, everyone, you know, everyone's an individual um, and, you know, if players feel that, that, that way, then you've got to respect them. Um, you know, you just mentioned two players there, and obviously I know N'Golo you know, really well. And you know, N'Golo for me, he's one of the, the most professional players I've ever seen. 
So, you know, and I think Chelsea will know that as well. So, me knowing him, um, you know, you have to respect his decision. And um, for me, you know, he loves football more than anyone. Like, it's his life. Um, so, he must be missing it just as much as anyone. So, for him to say that, you know, it must be, you know, um, you know, it must mean a lot to him to, to you know, to look after his health. For me personally, you know, I've missed it. And um, I said, it, it's, it's been my life. And for me, um, you know, I can't put myself, I'm not in Angolo's shoes and, you know, and, 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 and the, the condition that he he's, you know, spoke about. But for me, it was more about how it was going to work. And from day one going in and, and, and the way the club have, um, I've obviously listened to the EFL uh, and the conditions and, um, you know, everything gets wiped down. You know, we, we go in, it's, you know, the, we warm up on the bikes, we're two metres away from each other. You know, we're, we're doing circuit training, you know, and it's literally all in your own stations. Um, so, yeah, no, and, and, you know, and then it comes as we're finishing and it's literally finished training. The only difference is, you know, I know we say it's like tiny little things where, you finish training, you go in, you get a nice bath, you get a massage, you know, you, you shower, you know, you and then you get lunch, whatever it's now it's, you know, get in your car and leave. Yeah. Um so that that's been that, that's new for everyone, but again it's it's just nice to get back on the grass and yeah. and, and do a bit of work and phase one for me has, has gone pretty well and you know, obviously now we're waiting on you know contact and how phase two is gonna work. I think just to go back to Dej's um, original point where he said, you know, Angola Conte um, tried to have been reticent to return to training. Has there been anyone in the Huddersfield camp that has raised concerns with the manager or yourself because you're a senior player? But do they feel that, like, they have to return to training because if they don't, they're going to let the team down? So how do they manage that dynamic? Um, I think... Um... The only issue that that, that um, in our, our squad was more about the dates getting moved, and I think it was going to be the you no, know, correct me if I'm wrong. It was going to be the 19th, then it got, and then but on the 17th it got moved to the 26th or something like that. I oh, know it was going to be the 16th, then on the 14th, two days before the 16th, we're getting told it's going to be the 25th, 26th. You know, and for for some players that were you know, isolating with the families in London, you know, um, you're giving up, you're anxious, ready to come back. And two days before you think you're going to come back and maybe pack your stuff, leave your family, come up to your apartment and self-isolate alone to start training and then to get told, oh, it's another week. It was more about um, people getting a bit anxious and not knowing, um, you know, do I pack, do I leave my family and then do, is the date going to get changed again? Um, so that I think was the only real issue um, for players that, like I said, that maybe live in London and have to come up. Um, whereas some more for more like the local lads, you know, they were able to maybe yield in a in a, a, a cold, at Huddersfield because um, they live five minutes down the road. Um, and as long as they were, you know, it was safe and they were isolating. You know, I was using a field that's like two minutes from my house. Um, and you know it was quite a big field and I knew that that morning I heard Johnny Evans was on there then yeah. as I'm going on I've seen I've seen uh, Nemanja Matic on there wow. I've seen Martial <laughs> Bruno wow. Pandas, you know because you know I didn't even know this field was even around the corner from my house wow, wow. <laughs> yeah it's like um, it's like a, it's a school and then they've got their own separate pitches Um, but again even when I saw them players everyone was respecting um, the situation and you know, I was on one pitch and I saw, like I said, Martial and then, you know, they were on another pitch. Did you speak to them by any chance or did you communicate? Nah, it was just more, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's again, it's, I think it's like what people said, you know, you're walking down this road and people cross the road. Because you, know, yeah. you don't know how people actually feel about the situation. Everyone thinks different. Yeah. Um. So it's just more of yeah. Hello, we you know we're on this grass and this is the situation we're, that we're in. And mm. you know we, we, you have to try and keep yourself fit because okay. I'll tell you now if if you haven't kept yourself fit and you go back into the training we're doing now, then you're either going to get injured 
or you're gonna get found out. Yeah, yeah. And so from you know, I think you can see that you had to put the work in. Um, so we're gonna scroll, you know, to the beginning of your career, the embryonic um, stages of your journey. <laughs> You're a Manchester boy. Um, yeah. But the question I want to ask you is: um, earlier, um, I think last year, we saw a stat that Man United have named um, an academy graduate for 81 years in a row. Um, what is it about the Man United Academy that makes it imperative for them to have a homegrown player in their lineup? Because we've seen Marcus Rashford, we've seen Brandon Williams, Gary Neville, so many. What is it about the academy? Listen, I think that's. That's that's what excites. I said I know fans. We you know the fans love a big summer signing and and you know um, you know a player from abroad. Fancy name. He's gonna you know bring um, excitement. Goals like you see Bruno Fernandez now he's come to United and the impact he's made. But ultimately, I think for for fans to see a homegrown player play, you know, come through the ranks and know. You know, he's a, a Man United fan. You know, he's he's from Old Trafford. He's from Stretford. He's from the areas. Um, he's just probably played on the park with his mates uh, and the kids, literally down the road. And he could probably see Old Trafford. You know, and then to, to nurture them players and that talent uh, into the first team for me, there's no there's no better thing. Yeah, um, there's just no better thing. And like you said, you see it now. You know, you look at Marcus and. You know, I, I remember I did MUTV and we were talking about, um, you know, the, a lot of the youth players now that are getting a, a game and, you know, and I think United maybe not being in the Champions League and playing in the Europa League has actually gave these young players chance to play more games and more minutes because the Champions League is such, I think, such a big competition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, it's it's hard for a manager not to pick his best team, and I think when you when you've got a chance in the Europa League, like no, you know, I'm 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 not going to speak bad on any of the teams that are maybe have played against Man United in the Europa League, but it does it has gave Oli a chance to give some of these young lads minutes, and the more minutes you play, the more games you play, the more confident you feel, and the more you're going to see them progress, and I feel like that's what you've been seeing um, lately while Man United. I've not been in the Champions League and a lot of these kids have been getting a lot of minutes and game time and you know, look at Brandon Williams, you know, he's you know, playing games in the Europa League and then he feels confident. Next minute he's you know, he's playing against Chelsea, he's getting man of the match. Um, you know, he's giving Luke Shaw a run for his money. Yeah. I think he he's made Luke Shaw step up his game because I think he was towards the end of this corona situation, Luke was one of the United's best players. Um, and that's because a young lad's come through the ranks. He's confident. He's got game time, and he's showing how good he is. And I said, I said for me, I think that's why, you know, it's just exciting to see young players come through. And um, I think Man United will always will always be like be like that. And you know, with a manager like Oli, he he obviously one hundred percent understands how important that is. Yeah, so before we move on to your career at Man United, obviously, if you want to talk about the here and now. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, he's come under some criticism throughout his time at Manchester United. You know, people have been calling for him to go. People have been calling him a PE teacher. There's been a lot of abuse. So <laughs> how would you rate his time in charge of Manchester United? And do you think he's the man to ultimately lead Man United to winning silverware? Yeah, listen, it's that, like, some of them comments I feel are disrespectful. <laughs> You're very disrespectful, yeah. No, it's rude, man. <laughs> Um, listen, we've had, you know, Man United have had some, some of the best managers come in, and have managed top, top clubs and it's not worked out. Um, and what others had to do is each manager I feel is brought in, um, their players to play a certain way. Then you've got the manager brought in his players to play a certain way. And I feel like Oli is this needs time to go back to what Man United's about, and I think that's what he's been trying to do. Um, you know, and, and and the signings he's made, you know, we go through them. You know, Aaron, um, Basaka, um, 
you know, he's, he's done really well to jump from that to a big... Yeah, so Danny, man. what's your view on Aaron Wan-Bissaka? Because there's these whole debates of Wan-Bissaka or Trent. As a specialist at the right back, full position, what's your view on it? Who's better? If you could pick one, who would you pick? This is the thing. I don't think you can pick. Do you know what you do? They're both completely... Danny, you better not sit on the fence. Yeah. I don't If I was a manager mm. and um, for certain types of games, I think they both are good for certain teams and certain games. Remember when, like, um, Sir Alex, you know, we'd, you know, tough away games, Chelsea, Liverpool, Arsenal, he would play Park Ji Sung, you know, he'd play down Fletcher, you know, Sometimes it might be defensive, but it worked, you know. And then at home, it was about attacking, attacking, because that's what Old Trafford want to see, attack. Now, we all know how, Trent, how good Trent is going forward, you know. He's, we've seen his, how many assists he gets, his delivery on the ball. Um, then you look at Aaron, and no one's getting past him. Mm-hmm. But if you're marking Hazard, who would you rather play against Hazard, you know, away from home? You know, you'd rather play. I'd rather you'd rather play Aaron because you know he's going to lock him down, and that's Chelsea. And that would be at the time, would Chelsea's biggest threat. But then, no disrespect, if you're playing, I don't know, maybe a, you know, one of my old Newcastle at home. You know, you're going to play Trent because you're going to have a lot more possession of the ball. Now, I think everyone said I think um, he's come out, Oli, and Aaron's been working on. You know, he's crossing and his final third play, you know, but but that's going to take time because he was playing in a team at Crystal Palace where most of the time they defended and maybe didn't get into them areas as much as would do now for Man United. So, you know, it's it's a, it's a difficult debate. And I said, they both got different um, qualities. And, you know, for, for England, it's great. You know, if, if they're both there as two fullbacks in a, in a World Cup, for example, then... You've got two complete opposite fullbacks who can um, be strong in different areas. How do you sum up your time at Man United? Because yes, you played, you know, a few games for the club, but do you almost feel that your pathway was blocked because Gary Neville was so good? Um, see, I I learned a lot from. I based my game on Gary Neville, you know, when I managed to... Yeah, I was saying, um, you know, I, I learned a lot from, from Gary Neville and, you know, the, you know, the, the, the game's changed in terms of fullbacks. When I was coming through the ranks, you know, I was watching Gary Neville, Dennis Irwin, um, Gabriel Heinz, you know, these were the fullbacks um, that I grew up supporting and watching and, you know, you know, I was lucky enough to get into the first team squad uh, um, and Gary Neville, you know, helped me a lot um, in the time I was there. And you know, people don't even know this, but he even um, sorted out my contract. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yeah. How? Yeah. Basically, we all know that Sir Alex that didn't have it. You know, he wasn't a big fan of agents, um, and I didn't have one. Um, and I think I'd just been on loan, and I'd, um, I had a good spell. I came back. Um, uh, and and they offered me a contract, and I'd heard you know, Gary Neville can help with things like that, um, which is just the way he is. Um, yeah, you see him talking about everything nowadays: football, <laughs> politics, <laughs> everything. <laughs> it, but yeah, so I just I spoke to him and I said, "Look, I need help. Um, I I don't have an agent, and you know this is going to be my first professional contract." Um, and he said, don't worry, I'll sort it out. <laughs> yeah. um, so then he had a few meetings with the manager on his own. And then I remember then he came back, changed some numbers. <laughs> mm. um, and I remember him at the time, he was like, come on, guy. He was like, come on, boss. You know, Danny's going to be my replacement. Blah, blah, blah. You know, this was his negotiating skills at the time. Um, yeah, and then obviously at the time, it weren't even about money, but, um, you know, he was... You know, he said he sorted that out for me and went on from there. But I said I learned a lot from him and the, the game changed. But it was two little twins that that that, that caused me the uh, problem. Rafael Fabio? 
Yeah. Uh, when they got that work permit, me. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, oh, this is long. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. nah, like I said, I enjoy my time, you know, and I wish I played more. But you look back then, you was only allowed five subs. Um, it then it then got changed to seven, and you know, John O'Shea could play everywhere, so he was always going to be a sub. He could centre back, right back, left back, and um, he could play in centre midfield. So it was hard to even get on the bench. When you look at the squad back then that they had, you know, um, and and I think the season I remember because I'm good friends with Wes Brown. I think Gary Neville was injured, and Wes Brown throughout his career, career had injuries and stuff. And I remember saying to Wes one time, I said, the one season. You don't get injured. Is that season you end up playing forty-five games when they won the Champions League against Chelsea, mm. um, and he was fantastic. It was probably his best season for Man United, I think. Um, barring when he came through the ranks, um, but yeah, it was difficult to get in. You know, Owen Agrees at the time could play right back. Um, the obviously guy never was Brown, um, and then the twins got their permit. Um, and, and and they you know they burst onto the scene and, and they were both you know they were both incredible and I think that's when we started seeing a different type of fullback when we had Patrice Evra and Raphael. Um whereas before it was just it was Gary Neville and Heinz or Silvestri even at left back and I think that's when things started to change. So what did you actually learn from Alex Ferguson? Because everyone's got different stories. We hear about the hairdryer treatment. So what did you learn from him? <laughs> um, yeah, he still scares me to this day, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I got the hairdryer once as well. That wasn't nice. What <laughs> did you do? Uh, so basically, it was... You know, I was in the squad. I was travelling... So the game, um, we were playing Everton at home. Um, and I think it was John O'Shea pulled me and said, Simo, he said, I think you're playing. And it was like two hours before for, for the kickoff. And I'll be real, the night before the game, I went to bed really late because I thought, oh, I'm not on the bench. That's one thing I learned, not on the bench. You know, I'm not let alone going to play. You know, Everton at home. Um... I just thought I'm going to travel with the team, you know, you know, watch the game and, you know, Man United win in go train the next day. And then, you know, so Alex, he never did his team day before the game. He did it always on the day. Um, and I was in the team. Um, so, and he pulls me, he says, right, I think Lescott was playing there left back at the time. Uh, P now was playing left wing and we had Cahill up front. He was scoring a lot of headers. Yeah. They said to me, you've got one job, stop the crosses um, from that side because Cahill's good in the air, right? 20 minutes in, cross comes in from my side, Cahill 1-0, Edda. Mate, and I just, ever since, 70,000 fans, and it just, I crumbled, I'll be honest with you. And I remember thinking, why didn't I go to bed early? You know, and that's one thing that I always learn is you never know what's going to happen on game day. Even if you're not playing, someone could be ill, um, you could get injured in a warm-up. And I learned that from that day because I think we came in at 1-0 half-time and so Alex went mad, hairdryer in my face. You're off. I thought my world's over, life's over. You know, I'm never going to play football again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you put John O'Shea on and... The worst thing is, all the lads came up to me and patted me on the head, as if to say, like we've all been there. <laughs> and, and that was um, that was. And then the thing is, as well, then you sat in the dressing room, the lads go out, and if you know Old Trafford, you can't get a shower and come out the tunnel and walk all the way up mm. the side of the pits to join the bench again. So I literally just sat in the dressing room for the whole of the second half, thinking, please win. Um, I think Ronaldo scored two. We won two one. Mm. And manager came in after the game, went round, and well done, boys. Came up to me, well done, son. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm confused. But then and then, but then again, I think from what from when I spoke to the older players like Giggsy and that, sometimes even though he liked to test players and see what they're about, um, you know, he, he knows he sees you every day on the pitch and what you can do with you know your ability. But you know, he was massive on. You know, 
how to handle things mentally. Yeah. Uh, you know, do you go under? Do you, you know, do you rise up? Do you, do you, you know, get on with things? Because if you're playing for a team like Man United, you, you know, you have to be, be mental. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that, you know, that, that experience alone that I just spoke about was something I always remember and, and took with me through throughout my career is, like I said, be ready um, because you never know what's going to happen. And, um, yeah, I made sure after that, no matter what, I was asleep early before. <laughs> 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, <laughs> that's it, you're, you're done. <laughs> No, you want to wake up, make sure you're ready because you just never know what can, what can happen. And there's actually times throughout my career later down the line when, when that has happened. And I remember thinking, you know, I remember once, it was 30 minutes before kickoff, Richard De Leicester got injured in the warm up. I wasn't even on the bench. I was in my suit and I got dragged down to say, you're playing. Um, wow. But I was, you know, from that experience, you know, I was always ready for situations like that. But now, Sir Alex, man, he was. He knew everything about everyone, about your family, about he just knew everything about everyone. And um, you know, as scary as he was, you know, he was he was he was kind of like everyone's father figure. And you know, um, he 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 he's the one that created that that culture and the, and the family vibe and um, and and was was loyal to people in and around the training ground and the staff, etc. Yeah, so you had some loan spells. You went to Royal Antwerp under, you know, Warren Joyce. And obviously that partnership lasted for like 15 years. So it's similar to what we see now with Manchester City and Girona, Chelsea and Vitesse Arnhem. So from a personal standpoint, how was it going abroad to play? Because now we're seeing the fashion happen with players going abroad to Germany, learning their trade and coming back to the Premier League. Yeah, well... You know, back then I think I felt like, you know, when you when you sign, you're 16, 17, and you sign and you go full time, and you look at the pathway into the first team, um, and you looked at the players. Antwerp seemed to be, if you get selected to go Antwerp, you know, you're on the right road. Um, I know you start off with the youth cup, etc., and learning, being full time training, and you know, training every day, and you learn a lot. Uh, it's different to just being at school and training at night. Um, but going to Antwerp, if you know you had to get into the reserve team, uh, and then if you can get over to Antwerp and do well there, you normally you came back and then you was on the first um, on a pre-season tour with the first team. Mm. Um, and I remember it was some of my friends they got selected to go Antwerp. I remember knocking on his office in the bus and said and I said what well, I want to go <laughs> yeah and, he was, and then he was like let me think about it um, and then eventually he came back to me and said you know what yeah and I think that's because I shown you know like I want to do more I know this is the, the path and I want to be on it um, but yeah going out there was you know you, you had to grow up you know you go from living in digs you know you're, you're at home like I said your family your friends then all of a sudden you go over to Belgium and you're walking into a team and it's, you know, you're walking in and you're three or four Man United kids. These these are grown men. They don't want you to take their place. They don't want you to take yeah. their teammates' place. Uh, and you learn that as you get older and there was there was some trouble at the start, I'll be honest. A trouble. Um, there was fights. Like, you had to man up and stick up for yourself, you know, in training. You know, people were smashing each other and... Well, at the end of the day, these are grown men. We are still kids, but yeah. mm. because we've come over and we're saying, oh, they're Man United players, we wasn't Man United players. We were trying to be Man United players. Mm. And I think that's what, you know, we had to learn quickly. Um, and you had to literally grow up and, 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 and stick up for yourself or you didn't get no respect. And um, it wasn't a situation where you, you go to a team and you have to earn your place in the team. We kind of got given it. Because obviously, say it's a feeder club. It's the whole point. Um, but yeah, we had to get into a few rooks, <laughs> um, <laughs> look up for each other a little bit. But then, if you, you know, the, the the players respected us and they seen the ability and they, they seen that results started to change and we helped the team. Um, and but yeah, again, living abroad and you just like I said, you just learn a lot about yourselves and uh, being away from home and little things driving on the other side of the road and. Um, 
again starting to learn to cook for yourselves and things so yeah we you know i was there for a year and for me it was it was you know a massive massive experience growing up and um ready to to try and kick stay in england obviously you had you know a few other loan spells after that you went to sunderland you know ipswich you had a spell at blackburn rovers and then for me it seems like you kind of found home um, at newcastle um newcastle is a team that's you know steeped in history a very similar team to manchester united they've got passionate fans that you know follow the club all over the country what similarities did you see between the two clubs it was a bit strange week because obviously you must mention i had a spell at sunderland so mm. there's not, <laughs> not many players I've been at Sunderland and Newcastle. <laughs> yeah. How was that? Did they did they look at you funnily after that? I think because it was a long spell and it was in and in the time Sunderland in the championship and I never actually played against Newcastle in a dar before Sunderland. Mm. Um, you know, me and Johnny Evans, we left Antwerp to join Sunderland together. Mm. Um, um Keen as the manager. Um, and it, that felt like it was Man United because we had obviously Roy Keane, the manager. There's Dwight York was there, um, and you know when you know we were lucky enough to 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 win the title. Um, but then, like you had mentioned, um, Newcastle was, you know that 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 place is just crazy, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, them, 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 nah, their fans like, like oh, yeah, you know they're so passionate. It's their life. You know you hear it all the time. It is actually their life. Um, and and you hear players who were playing there or you know played there before is a goldfish bowl, and it literally is. And um, if you if 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 you give hundred percent for them, you know they'll they'll love you, and that's all they want to see from the players is is hundred percent and and action. And you know I was fortunate enough to play in a really good Newcastle team, and when I look back, you know. Since then, I don't think there's been a better time for Newcastle because you know, we to, to get relegated, I wasn't there, but I signed that summer. Mm. It's tough for teams sometimes to get relegated and mm. to, to, to bounce back up straight away. Um, and Chris Hutton was, was, was amazing, you know, we you know, we he, he got players that he didn't think either A wanted to be there or B um, wasn't going to help. Um, he created, he kept the players and he created a, a culture and atmosphere. You know, experienced players, Kevin Nolan, Joey Barton, Alan Smith, you know, players that he knew, you know, we could rely on um, because it was a tough situation at the time for Newcastle and, you know, to bounce back up the way we did and win the league, um, it just got the fans, you know, buzzing again and then back in the Premier League, you know, Chris, it didn't work out. And then Alan yeah, Pardew, so Danny. How is Chris as a manager? Because when you hear people talk about him, they say he's a man that's got dignity, he's an honourable man, but you rarely hear people talk about his actual managerial ability. So what is it about him that makes him such a good manager? Listen, look, for me, look, look, look at, you know, it, it, I don't think Newcastle must have been his first manager, managing job. To manage such a big club um, like that, at such a turmoil time, um, make decisions on players, bringing players in, um, you know, pressure on him. You know, Newcastle's a massive club in the championship to get them out of that, that league. And for me, you know, he was brilliant. And, I, and it's no surprise why he's, he's still, you know, he's gone on and managed other clubs and done well with them. Because um, he is a good manager. Um, and again, it was like I said, it was just unfortunate that in the Premier League that season, I feel like as soon as maybe three, four games, I always felt like he was going to go. Um, How did you feel that? I think everyone did. Maybe, you know, he's, he's been there as a coach. I don't know. Everyone just felt like, you know, maybe Mike Ash at the time, you know, he he's he seen the club going forward in a different route and... I think obviously I think he's grateful to Chris for what he did that season and maybe half a season because I think Alan Pardew came in around December. Yeah. Um, but um, it just obviously didn't feel like he was the was the man to can keep Newcastle, 
you know, pushing on. Um, you know, and we all love Chris, um, respected him, um, especially for me. You know, I, I owe him a lot because, you know, he, he brought me there. He gave me a chance and, um, and, and you know, when Newcastle, you know, heard were, were, were in for me, you know, going up there, playing in front of 55. You know, we're in the championship. We're getting 45,000 fans a week <laughs> in the championship. Like, that says a lot about, you know, Newcastle. Um, so yeah, I owe a lot to Chris for that. And um, I remember actually when we won the league, um, I don't even know he still have a number, but I got the number. <laughs> <and he's laughs> saying like, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. And, you know, this is God knows how many years on since, you know, we worked together. Um, and I think, again, that shows the, the type of man he was to get my number maybe, what, four years later? And, and 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 wish me congratulations. Yeah, so you mentioned Alan Pardew came in. Um, he's a manager in some quarters that polarises opinion. I remember hearing at Palace of him coming into training in a red Ferrari. Not that I think there's anything wrong with that. But how is he? Like, we saw him in the FA Cup final, you know, doing that dance <laughs> when Palace scored. So how is Alan Pardew? Man? Yeah. <laughs> how is he to work with? Uh, honestly, again, for me, it, it, it was great. Um, at the time, I had a few issues after pitch and, you know, he was he was fantastic. He, 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 he had me in the office and he supported his team, supported his players. He was always there for them. Um, I always remember, it was on a Friday, um, one of the coaches, if he came in the dressing room and asked to speak to, like, oh, I imagine it's, uh, Danny, manager, one shot. You walk into his office and you know your, <laughs> you know on a Saturday, yeah. But he would tell you on a Friday, this is I'm dropping you. This is why, you know, get your head around it. You know, I'm not saying this is the end for you, but this is a situation. I'm going to go with him tomorrow. And he was just for me. He was always clear and honest. Um, and sometimes that's all you want to know. You know, if you get dropped from a game, sometimes. You don't get told why, and you just get told to get on with it. And I feel like players react and prefer to be told before why. And listen, everyone's different. Every manager's different. They have the different t- tactics. But he was always honest and clear. And you look at when he came in. You know, I think we finished, you know, around mid-table um, that season, the first year in the Premier League, which which is good going. Then the, people forget about the season after when we finish fifth. What a what a December bar papi season. Yeah, we ah. finish, oh. we finish, people forget that we finished fifth in the Premier League in the second season in the Premier League after coming mm. up from the Championship. You know, and the team that we had, you know, Ben Arthur, you know, combined, you know, oh. to you know, bless him and what's happened bless to him. him. And, you know, and and like you said, there, Denver Bar and Papi C say scoring crazy goals and yeah, magic, that magic. one at Chelsea, magic that game at Chelsea. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that was <laughs> I see more. How was that? Was that <laughs> Someone picked that ball up and moved it for him. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Drogba even went over to Pardew and was like, "What's going on? How did he do that sort of thing?" It was mad though. He was doing that in training. This is the thing. Wow. He, he was taking shots from angles. You're like, you're not going to shoot from there. <laughs> <laughs> <Get a net. laughs> um, yeah, he came in and was on fire. And I said, and Demba was class. You know, I love Demba. You know, what a character he was. And the back four was solid. Colagini was a good leader. Mm. He was good on the ball. Read the game well. Um, just gave, you know, that composure that we needed at the back. Um, it was him, Stephen Taylor. It was me, Jose Miki. You know, we were, you know Tim Cool. You know, it was a good team. Um, and yeah, and I said to finish fifth that year was I just think didn't ever really, you know, get 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 as much credit as it deserved. And the year after, you're going into the Europa League, and you know, I found this difficult with Leicester. And if you're just used to Saturday, Saturday in a Premier League, and then all of a sudden you got a midweek European game. It's a completely new, you know, a new thing for everyone involved. Um, and even that got to the quarter final. Mm. Benfica, yeah. Benfica, yeah. I, think, I think we needed one more goal at home. Um, 
you know, when we would have had a semi-final, I think that year Chelsea ended up playing Benfica maybe in the final. Um, yeah, you know, even that. But then we, we suffered in the Premier League because of the Europe, obviously because of the Europa League. Mm. Um, and then for me, it was, you know, I moved on from that point on. And, you know, they wanted, you know, they, we signed a Bushi and it was time to move on. But again, that four years for me, you look at it, it was you know, good three or four years for Newcastle, I think. Because it could have gone easy, gone the other way once they got relegated. Definitely. Now, last one um, on Newcastle from me. Um, we had um, John Joe Shelby recently on the podcast. And, you know, he said, you know, the, the takeover needs to happen for the fans because, you know, this is a city that, you know, once, you know, they get behind the club, the whole city just rocks. So, obviously, there's been a lot of talk in regards to this takeover. Do you feel that it needs to happen for the Newcastle faithful as well? Look, I think, I think you know, it's, it's the, you know, the Mike Ashley and Newcastle fan situation, it's not going to change, is it? You know, you know even when, when Rafa was the manager, um, it's that unrest, you know, you, I just don't feel like while there's, there's that you know, animosity there and, you know, and, and uh, lingering around, I don't feel like you're ever going to be in a place to, to kick on. Um, because you feel it as players, you know, the fans, the fans are getting frustrated, you know, for, you know, it's, 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 it's you know, I'm not sure how many years, you know, Mike Hassey and, you know, the fans, how long that's been now, but maybe it is time, um, you know, the fans, you know, the, the fans don't want to be down fighting relegation every year. Um, you know, we mentioned before about finishing fifth and, you know, it's a massive club, 50 or thousand fans and, you know, maybe it's time that the takeover happens and, you know, when we see where, you know, where that takes the club. But again, even if that comes in and this guy's worth billions of pounds, it's still got to be the right planning. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. You're still going to have to have patience. Um, and it's all comes down to the structure. And I feel you look at what Leicester did and that structure that, you know, Vichai, you know, you know bless him as well. Like, bless he's, him. You know, he, he, he came in and he set that structure, you know, seven years ago when he first took over yeah. and he built it from then in League One. Um, so, yeah, we got to a point where we won the Premier League, but it started, you know, um, with him and his son top years yeah. and years and years ago. And the club was, was from top to bottom, was, was together and was getting built in the right way. Um, and I feel like if the takeover happens, I think... Newcastle has got everything there to, to to you know start from scratch and build a structure and and, and, and kick on and, and it'll it, it'll take time. Yeah. So after you left um, Newcastle, you had a season at QPR under Harry Redknapp, which ultimately culminated in you know promotion to the Premier League in the playoffs. I think it was a Bobby Zamora goal against Derby that settled it. Yeah. So then after that, you had the option to... I'm assuming for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so you had the option to like maybe stay on, but you decided to move to Leicester. What actually governed that decision? Because it's a big risk, you know? It wasn't an option, I'll tell you that now. Um, okay. Yeah, that, that got made for me. Um, oh. There's people where we don't know. Maybe, I'm not sure the QPR fans know about this, but... You know, I said I played most part of that season, 40 games, playoff final, Wembley, you dream of that. You know, everyone, you know, it might not be the FA Cup final, which everyone dreams of as a kid, but still, you know, Wembley, a final, it was one of the most nerve-wracking games I've ever played in because, you you know, the FA Cup final, is you're there to win a trophy and a medal, but the playoff final, it's, it's the next 12 months of your life. You know, getting a, either you're playing in the Premier League or you're back in the Championship, and it's one game. Um, and I remember it. I watched it the other day on the clips, and um, we didn't really deserve to go up that day, <laughs> that final that day. You know, we wasn't Derby. You know, we we're really good. And like you said, it fell to Bobby, and you know, last minute is one of those moments that stay with you forever. And mm. Um, you know, then the few days after that was was really <laughs> I remember was 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 good times. And you come back Premier League, you buzz 
locked in. You know, you're finally back in the Premier League. Um, great players, great squad, and you know um, we signed Rio. He signed Rio Ferdinand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was pre-season. I was rooming with him, and um, Harry decided to play free. We wanted to play free at the back with Rio in the middle of the free yeah. and wing backs. Yeah. Now I'm not really because I'm an old school right back. I'm not really, you know, a wing back so to speak. Um, and one day he just came in. Listen, I've I've had some phone calls from Leicester. Um, you know, I, I think it's time. I think he should go. Wow. I was like, what? Hey, I don't think he has left on a contract. I just played every game. <laughs> you know, I think I, I started the first game of, in the Premier League that year as well. Um, and I, I, I was like, obviously, if you hear a manager say that, mm. you know. You're thinking, right? Well, I'm, 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 I'm off then. So I've gone into the dressing room. Shout Mike Phillips, JJ, you know all the boys, Joey, all them. I said, boys, I'm off. <laughs> I'm clearing out my locker. <laughs> They're like, what do you mean? I was like, I was like, oh, he just told me he's telling me. They're like, nah, I'm not gonna say the words. But nah, you're chatting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can swear on me, by the way. I'll see you tomorrow, innit? I was like, boys, I'm telling you now, I'm gone. He just told me. I left. Nine o'clock that night, phone call. I fill it bed. Said, we've accepted the offer. You can go tomorrow and do your medical. Never step foot in the training ground at QPR ever again. Um, packed up my stuff, put it in my car. Drove to Leicester um, to do my medical. Um, and by again, 24 hours later, by eight, nine o'clock that night, I'd signed wow. um, just within honestly two to three days just like that I w it was it had gone it wasn't even like I'd heard for weeks and weeks and weeks it was literally two three days and I'd gone um, wow. obviously now I look back and I'm glad he sold me <laughs> 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 yeah I never thanked him because obviously what happened after that so you know I'm obviously I'm glad he, he sold me but at the time no, I was frustrated because I felt like I was starting something there and, you know, we got them out of, again, they got relegated and we got them out of, of the championship, which is difficult to do. Um, and we, again, experienced players and time to build again, but, you know, it wasn't to be. So, obviously, you then moved to Leicester. Um, Nigel Pearson brought you in. Um, and at the time, he was doing a good job but later on in his Leicester career, his position became untenable and he lost mm. his job. Um, and I recall very well, um, Van Leary was brought in and a lot of the media were saying, what's going on? Leicester brought in a manager that's just lost to, to Fisherman. Yeah. Why, why are you bringing yeah. him in? He's, he's a finished manager. At that current time, what was your feeling towards Claudio Van Leary? Um, that was the, that was it, was it was a strange one for me because I I had um, that summer the club had before he came in the club had said to me oh look you know I hadn't played much Richard Delap was still um, the main right back um, you know the club had said maybe it's time to move on but as much as the time when uh, QPR had said it this time. I said, no, nah, I'm not going. <laughs> like, I'm not doing this again. Like, um, you know, I've, I've, I maybe only played 15 games that season. When I did play, I'd done well. Yeah. I was like, this time I was like, no, nah, I'm fight, I'm, I'm fighting. I ain't leaving. So I said, I don't, I don't care. Like, and a lot of people don't know. So, Van Avery comes in, and I will tell you something. I'm really good friends with Sean Mike Phillips. And I think obviously he worked with him and he rang me and said, Simo, I've heard like you might be leaving. He said, stick in. He said, stick in till at least January. He said that then if you don't have anything till January, you got the January channel and then move on. He said, but Claudio will love you. He said, he loves defenders. He said, so seriously, get your head down and I, I, I guarantee you'll end up playing. Now, obviously, this is Sean Mike Phillips, you know, a good friend. You know, he's, a, he's, you know, he's, he's, you know, for me, he's a legend and what he's done in the game. Um, 
for the first six weeks, I was with the 23s. I was with the kids. <laughs> that season that we won the league. Yeah. I'm with the kids. I didn't even train with the boys. But I, I, I said, nah, it was, it was time to get my head down. Um, stuff had happened off the pitch. Time to get my head down and, and fight. And then I remember one day, Steve Walsh pulled me and said, Claudio wants to speak to you. I thought, oh, what have I done now? I'm in trouble. Like, what have I done? <laughs> I go to see Claudio. And he said, look, because there was a couple of times I got dropped into the first team sessions. Yeah. And it felt like I was 18 again. You know, running around like a madman, like trying to kick everyone and impress and just, you know, just, it was, it was just, I just remember I felt like a kid again, like trying to get into Man United's team. Um, and then he pulled me in and said, look, you know, I like your attitude. And, and it's, for me, this is a big man to say what he said to me. He said, maybe I made a mistake. He said, um, I feel like you could help me this season. Um, he said, keep doing what you're doing and you might get a game. A week later, we uh, Leicester lost, I think it was 5-3 to Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. That season, and conceded five goals at home. And Leicester actually played well. Um, and the following week, I was in the team. <laughs> Started out of nowhere. Um, me, and then it literally went from... Attacking fullbacks, he brought me and Christian Fuchs in, and I never looked back. I played every game since then, and you know, the rest was history. And we went on to obviously win the title. And but it was that again, the first six weeks, you know, people don't really know that's what was happening. But I had to fight and keep my play and, and try and get, get in a team. And, and, and you know, thankfully, I, I did decide to stay, and um, because. You know, that was the best time of my life. Talk, talk to us about that title win. Because for me, that was the most spectacular Premier League victory that we've ever seen. So how, how was it? I don't even know how to explain it. <laughs> like, we didn't, it's weird because we didn't, we didn't speak about it. We didn't, we didn't, um, oh no, no, later. Sorry to say that. We, um, we ever, we didn't ever sit and think, Oh, we're going to win the league. We can win the league. We were just in our own little like bubble that Claudio had created, and it was next game, next game, and we we had we had no fear, we weren't scared of anyone. It was that attitude that we had, and and we the the, the way we played, the plan, the game plan, the players we had, it just worked. <laughs> Um, you know, we had, I think every single one of us was playing probably the best um, at the time we've ever played in our career. And, you know, and when you've got a goal or team, <laughs> you, you've got a chance. <laughs> 12 you know, that, playing players. He's, he's different, mate. I've never seen anything like it in my life. <laughs> um, you know, and even him at the start as well, he, I remember his first game, he played left wing. And we're like, next minute, he, he was sent a mid and he was just like, who is this kid? Um, and it and, and was just, honestly, he's, he was unbelievable. And obviously, you know, what everyone else, you know, Riyad, my relationship with Riyad worked. Uh, we complimented each other and, you know, we got off the pitch and then everyone had relationships and, you know, me and Wes Morgan, like, all we did for 90 minutes, <laughs> like, we just, we just literally, honestly, we're like best of friends now, and we always was then anyway. But I mean, literally for ninety minutes, all we did was scream at each other. <laughs> but it was like we wanted to win, and we was gonna help each other and support each other. And like I said everyone had their own little relationships, and it, it just worked. And you know, to finally do it, and you know, and, and the way we did, and you know, to to all be at Jamie's house that night as well was, yeah. you know, that was because imagine we all watched it at home. That Chelsea game, and I don't know, it wouldn't have been the same. Mm -hmm. And you come in the next morning, the training ground, like, oh my god, like no. But thankfully, Jamie sent out a text to everyone, and um, you know, a Jamie Vardy party as it is. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, and you know, he sent out a message because the day before we we could have won it at Old Trafford, and we didn't. Um, so he's like, lads, let's get together because you never know. Um, yeah, and that, that, like that, that, I'll never, I'll never forget that night. You know, all together at his house, and you know, and you obviously could probably see all the, the 
clips and always in the scenes, it was it was special. Yeah, so um, Danny, like, what was the game during that campaign where you thought, you know what, we can actually do this? Because I remember during the season, a lot of people were saying, you know what, this is going to fall off the wheels very, very soon. But you just kept winning and winning. Then that sort of built like a momentum, especially at the King Power. There was the clappers, the fans were totally at it. So, like, what was the game where you said, you know what, this is possible, you know? Um... There's a couple of moments for me throughout the season. Obviously, the City game. Yeah, away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 4 1. The point where we could have, I think we won 3 1, and I think we could have won by more than. And I remember coming in the dressing room, I'm a Man United fan as well. So, you know, half my half my family is City fans. So I'm like, not just buzzing about that anyway, I'm like, I'm sat in the dressing room and it was quiet. It was pretty quiet, and everyone was like looking at each other, like, "Have we just done that to Man City?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, on their on their patch, you know, um, we had that we had goal, I think hoof, couple yeah. of headers, um, and I think that was when a little bit we were like, oh, "Hey, we're not a bad team." <laughs> you know, we're absolutely, you know, we, and I think that gave us. Bit like the confidence to then go right. We can do if we can do that to Man City. We can do it to anyone. Um, then for me, in personally, I had a blip when we played Arsenal on Valentine's Day. Mm. I got sent off. Yep. And it wasn't a sending off, but I got sent off. <laughs> and and, and, and my mate Welbeck comes on. It was like it was written in the stars. He'd been injured for God knows yeah. how. Yeah. <laughs> was that the two-one game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Late, late winter. I've, I've yeah. Smashed half the dressing room up. <laughs> I'm feeling so alone. Like we're one nil up, one-one. I'm thinking, please just get a draw. <laughs> well, bet comes on, man. <laughs> man, like Wells comes in. First game back, scores a winner. I the celebration thought, was mad as well. Was that you? Yeah, like, Simo, look what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but nah, like, you know, I, I understand because he'd been injured for so long. He'd come back. Imagine you score a winner. That's a striker. That's what every striker wants to do. But and I remember we come in and people don't know this. I, obviously, I feel like, oh, it's all my fault, etc. And Claudio came in. And I think the next next week my FA Cup and we wasn't in it and he came in and he said see you next Monday have a week off and we're like hey he said he said forget today it happens I want you to go away he always used to say clear your mind he used to say this all the time <laughs> clear your mind you know the way he speaks and stuff you know <laughs> he comes out with these things he say clear your mind and he said go home see your friends see your family whatever you need to do that week Go and do it, because when we come back next Monday, obviously the FA Cup, get that weekend out of the way, and we're going for it. Um, and, yeah, we came back in on the Monday. Um, good little break to get away from everyone and come back, and, you know, and, and, and we kicked on. And I think for me, talking about what you said, for me, when I thought, it, it, when I really thought we won the league was, was, the, West, was the West Ham game. Mm. I know it was right towards the end but I didn't want to believe I was going to win it because I just didn't want that in my mindset um, and I think we, we went 1-0 up it was Morgan give a penalty away 1-1 I think we've already got sent off and we're like we just lost your main man um, Cresswell puts one in the top corner and we're 2-1 down minute to go Schluck gets a penalty and Leo Ejoa puts it away 2-2 two, two, and that's when I felt like yeah this is this is this is this is our time now even you know that is, I think we've won it so for me everyone's different I think you ask other players um, they talk about a Crystal Palace game and stuff but for me that was like my three moments throughout the season the City ERS West Ham game Simo obviously that team was you know littered with um, top class talent I mean Riyad Mahrez that was, you know, snapping ankles on the wings. <laughs> and then Gallo Conte that was covering the whole pitch. Yeah. But the player I want to speak about is Jamie Vardy. Because this is a guy that's come from non-league and he's become a Premier League winner and an England international. 
Do you think we will ever see the likes of a Jamie Vardy again? Mm, I hope so. I hope so for English football and for England. Um, but I don't, I don't think you will. Really? You know, that, you know we, we, you know, he, he, he's raw. Hmm. And he'd never been coached. He was just raw. And, you know, and these young lads now, listen, it's great, the coaches and all that, I get it. But sometimes it can get coached out of you. And he, 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 he was just, he, again, and even now, he's still the same player. Hmm. You know, he knows what he's good at. And when he's angry... There's no one better than him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he went on that mad run during yeah. that season as well. You know, we talk about his goals, but we forget his tackles. Like yeah. he can smash me. You know, and when you and you know, and as a in your team, when you see your striker and he gets a little bit mad about maybe a refereeing decision, and he's chasing that fullback and he smashes the fullback and he lifts the play at the fans, and then as a midfield and a back four. He just gives you everyone a lift. Um, and it's like, yeah, Vardy's on it today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's put, get that ball in behind because he's going to, no matter what, he's winning that ball. Whoever he's racing against, he's going to get it. And you forget he's finishing, mate. He, don't, mm. he doesn't need that many. You don't need many chances. Let's wax it in. One man. chance. Yeah, goal. <laughs> it's a goal. It's just that raw talent, and you know, I'm 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 glad I I played with him, and um, and I know him, and like I said I'm glad to see that he's still doing it. You know, people talk about his age, and he's still doing it. Maybe he doesn't make as many runs in behind as he used to, but now he's you know he he makes um, he's selected, and you know he's still scoring all the goals, and he's getting a, he's starting to get a lot of goals in the box now as well, and. You know, it's a credit to, to him and, and what he's done because I don't, you know, what is it? Maybe 100 goals in maybe 200 games or so or something, one in two or something like that. The Premier League legend for me. Yeah, yeah. he is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so so Danny, um, obviously that led to winning the title and the fans used to sing, we're all going on a European tour, a yeah. European tour. You know, yeah. that was reverberating around the stadium. So bring on next season, you know, you had Port. Of Hagen and another team in your group, and you negotiated that successfully, but yeah. the league form actually dwindled. Yeah, and I remember it was the Sevilla game, you know, where Ranieri was given these marching orders. Mm-hmm. Around the media, they were saying, you know, they were calling the King Power Stadium the Player Power Stadium because apparently the players got Claudio Ranieri, Ranieri the sack. Yeah, you were inside that dressing room. What actually happened and what led to Ranieri's departure? Come on, man. That's, that's a lot of nonsense. You, talk, you know, we're talking about a respectful businessman, respectful owner of multiple, not just owning last time, um, a successful businessman back home in Thailand. Do you honestly think he's going to listen to maybe a few players saying we don't like this manager now? Yeah, but Danny, apparently there was rumours coming out that the owners and the management team consulted with a few of the select players, Shemichael, Vardy, yourselves, and you all gave like negative feedback saying, you know what, we're not happy and we feel change is necessary. What happened? No, that, 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 that story only really came out because he's, um, he'd, he'd been like that from day one when, he had, when Nigel was the manager. Um, you know, from day one, he, was, he he always had a good relationship and he was always at the training ground, like different to any other chairman I've had, you know, where, you know, some chairmen I played for that I've never even spoke to, like, you know, and that was just him. He, 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 he wanted to create his culture and a family and and that's why he was so giving and, you know, we'd give things to the fans and free beers and, you know, free this. Oh, nuts. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's him. And, you know, and, and with the staff and the training round, you know, everyone played their part and that's how he was. And then obviously the players and he wanted to make sure that we're okay. And there's times where I was going through things and, you know, 
you know, he stuck by me, he stuck by other players, and that's just the way he was, his relationship. Where I think that's why that came about, because you don't really see that anymore with owners and players. And, and like I said, it ain't just players, it was staff. And obviously, I said I said before, that season was difficult to get, you know, to go from playing Saturday, Saturday, focusing on, on so now all of a sudden, you've got players that have never really played in the Champions League before. You know, there was a lot of pressure anyway because every weekend I oh, were playing the champions, we're playing the champions. I always go back to that first game against Hull. And that was, you know, your first game back in the season, you lose to Hull, who've just been promoted away. And straight away, that's the negativity just kicked mm. in. And I really feel like I look back, I think if we'd have just won that first game, you know, I swear it's crazy to say, but things might have been different. But that, that first game, we lose to Hull the way we did. We were a shadow of ourselves. And people start talking about, oh, they got new contracts, they've done this, they've done all these things that media does. And, um, and again, I said, getting used to playing a Saturday, travelling, playing a, uh, in Europe, coming back Friday, Thursday night, uh, Thursday morning even, Wednesday night, getting ready for the next game. You know, that Premier League season, we had a settled team that played the same team every week. And then Claudio, it was new to everyone, we had to rotate. Some people didn't want to play every game. Some people got dropped, you know, and it's just things just changed. And, and yeah, and, you know, unfortunately, it, it, it led to him. So were the players unhappy in the changing room around his departure? Because it looked, you know, a bit suspect when I think he was sacked. Then under Shakespeare, you know, you ended up beating a Liverpool and everyone's sort of saying, hang on about, like, what's happening? You've yeah, been playing poorly, a new manager comes in, then you're back to normal. Well, you say that, but I, I'd like to think if I was a betting man, which I'm not, and I'm not allowed, but as soon as a new manager comes in, I'm pretty sure nine times out of ten, that team normally then wins. <laughs> yeah, but Danny, we, we spoke to Joe Leon Lesquart and he said players can turn it on like a light. <laughs> you can switch it off and switch it on. So that theory where, you know, you can't, he said that's not true. Players actually can. So is that what happened at Leicester? Nah, the thing is, there was, there was things that, you know, sometimes when you get a bit of unrest in the camera, it's hard, it, it lingers. I can't explain the feeling. So what was the unrest at the time? Because you've obviously cool. left the club now, so obviously you can shed light. What was actually going on in the camp? Maybe the play, like maybe I said, player rotation, um, not being used to that. Like I said, people wanted to play Champions League, he was getting dropped. I got dropped to a Champions League, the first Champions League game. I'm fuming. They played, they played Luis Hernandez. I'm sat there thinking, well, I've just, you know, spent all that season, you know, working my socks off to play in the Champions League. First Champions League game, I ain't playing, mm. <laughs> you know. And, and and that was Claudio's way. He, 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 you know, we had to rotate. And um, I feel like, as mentioned before, maybe the only thing that he didn't do, because he never had to do it the season before, it, when we won the league, he only ever made changes if it was due to suspension or injury. Mm. Um, so no one ever had to get pulled to the side and say, this is why I'm not playing you. You know, uh, I feel you're better for this game on Saturday, which is what Sir Alex always did. You always hear the story about what Sir Alex would, would, would speak to Darren Fletcher and say to him, in four games, you're playing. Yeah. You know, and, and little things like that, players just want to know. So I feel like even that example with me, I was, I was saying I was pissed off. I'm not playing the first Champions League game in Leicester's history. I was pissed off at Luis Hernandez <laughs> had just been signed and he's playing Champions League. What? Because he's foreign and he, he might know that this is what I'm... I'm thinking <laughs> he's foreign and you think he knows European football better than me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I think there was there was little, little instances like that where maybe he could have, you know, pulled a player to the side and said, this is why I'm not playing you today or tomorrow. It's not for any other reason, um, but be ready for the next game. And I feel like the year before, we never had that. Um, it was, this is your team. We all knew the subs. Even the away teams knew the subs. Mm. You know, we knew that Leo Shinji Okazaki was coming off after 60 minutes. <laughs> running his socks off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, yeah, you know, Shinji will give you one hour of, 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 you know, 
run around like a madman for 60 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then Leo Rajo would come on and give us a different option, mm. you know, and hold it up and flick on for, back for, for Jamie. And um, oh, Jeff Sutt would come on in the wing and give us more pace and carry the ball and push us up the pitch. Andy King might come on um, and show up the midfield uh, and have three in there, you know, and that was, that was, we knew every week that was the situation. Um, and then I said again, I think the year after, I feel the European thing and maybe some of the signings we made, maybe, I don't like to say this because I, like I like the boys. Are you but, talking about Slimani, Napolis yeah. Mendy and... No, no, yeah, mate, what I'm saying is that, that we, maybe there wasn't the signings, they didn't fit in with what we built or created in the dressing room. Like, nothing bad on them as bad people, but, um, you know, we, like I said, we brought in players in for big money and, you know, some man, great character, don't get wrong. <laughs> um, you know, Musa and he just didn't work. You know, Papi Mendy, lovely, lovely lad. Spoke to him yesterday, actually. Um, he, him, he's, you know, him and Johan Benalawan rang me. Um, he, he was, he was, I don't know, he just, maybe there's some the signings, maybe that, that window could have maybe been a little bit different, maybe a bit more British based. I don't know. But it just didn't, it just, the, 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 it just didn't click for whatever reason after that window. And, and then I feel after that, Leicester made the right kind of signings that maybe we should have made at that time, you know, Madison, you know, um, you know Kagla, um, Tillemans, you know, and, Maybe that window when you just won a Premier League could have been a little bit different with the money that, that got spent. But I, I recall you getting into a social media spat with um, Jamie Carragher. And <laughs> I mean, he accused you of being the worst um, Premier League winner of all time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming, Simo. I'm coming, I'm coming. I know you want to let off some steam, but I'm coming. Do you almost feel like people have the wrong perception of you? Because you've had, you know, glamorous partners, you know, X on the Beach model, um, Talisa. Dubs. And Dubs, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because when I look at your career, you've played over 400 games. Um, you've got promoted, you know, three times to the Premier League. You've won a Premier League title. But then I look at your England career and I see zero caps. Yeah. Yeah, like, listen, like, you get older, you look back and um, it's like you said, there's not many players that have got promoted three times, championship, obviously Premier League and playing for your boyhood club, um, playing with some of the best players in the world, Ronaldo, Scholes. Um, but yeah, some of that stuff probably does overshadow some of that. And you're young, man, we're all human. You know, I'm not saying... You get with a certain partner, you know. We've seen players get with celebrities and X, Y, Z, and um, I look back and yeah, it definitely does overshadow it. Some certain incidents and the way I'm viewed, and you know, and yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's it's frustrating, um, and it is it is upsetting, and you know, there's been times I've struggled, you know, mentally with certain things, um, but yeah. I'd, some of that stuff's been on the front of the papers and um, you, like you said, you forget some of the stuff I have done on the pitch and you know, the Jamie Carragher thing, to be fair, was a bit of banner. Um, <laughs> mine, he says I'm the worst one. Well, at least I still got that medal. Do you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> yeah, no, but no, we, you know, we, you know, me and him, we, you know, we had a bit of banner. It went too far. That's, you know, publicly. and um, But that's just more as well. I'm a United fan. You know, I grew up this whole hate Liverpool mentality um, and you know he was giving us a bit of stick uh, and, and then one day I seen him in a in an Everton kit and I thought I'm going to give him so <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah no but no I said the serious note now and the other stuff yeah there's, 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 there's been times where I could have made different decisions and um, but young and, and you know there was a time when Listen, <laughs> sometimes I like to go out. <laughs> like, Come on. Of yeah, course. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it as it is. You know, we're not robots. Like, 
you know, as long as it's the right time, um, go out and let, let, let off some steam. And um, it's, it's unfortunately for me, there was a couple of times I ended up um, in the front of the, the, the paper and that's the price you pay. And, 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 and you know, now when, you know, going forward, I want to help young kids and I want to give them advice and, because there is certain things, there is there's ways to do it without the way I did it, <laughs> um, and, and you know, and give them advice. And listen, it's football goes like that, and you know, I want to help some young boys and and, and 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 try and explain to it. But sometimes when you're young, you don't want to listen, and and you think you know best. And at certain points in time, that that's, that's what I thought. Um, but ultimately, you ask anyone that ever trained with me, played with me, they'll say that it don't matter what, I gave 100%. And it's funny because I was watching the Michael Jordan thing. Yeah, last yeah. dance. Yeah. And I had a few of the boys message me saying, Simo, you're like Rodman. <laughs> 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 but I, I don't know if it's as a compliment or not, but <laughs> I think one thing that you say there with him, I think they knew he, he, on, the pit, on, the, on the court, and with me on the pitch, I'll give 100% for my boys and, and for my team and for the fans and for the manager. And that's one thing I say, regardless of anything else, I can look in the mirror and say, from from leaving school to today, on that pitch, I gave 100% for every team uh, and every teammate and every manager. Yeah, so Danny, obviously your Leicester fairy tale came and obviously when Brendan Rodgers came in, they brought in a fullback, Perea, from um, Porto, I believe. Fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Brendan Rodgers obviously said, you can stay at the club. He's got no issue with that. But you would have to be a number two under yeah. Pereira. So why did you make that decision to leave when initially you had a battle with Claudio Ranieri and you decided to stay and fight? But at this opportunity, you thought, you know what, let me go. Do you know what it is? I felt like... I was I was so used to playing for Leicester every week um, for years. Um, and this little man, Ricardo, who I'm friends with. <laughs> what a player. I'm looking at him, I'm thinking. Mm, it's a bit political <laughs> still. I can work my absolute bollocks off in training every single day. This guy's going to play. <laughs> you know, and I didn't want to... It's different if you think you're up against a teammate and you think, right, you know, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to show, I'm going to get ahead of him. Um, you know, I was coming up to 30 plus and oh, you, you love match days. You know, I love playing and I knew the only way I was going to play is if he got injured and you don't want to sit there frustrated I wouldn't say wishing that someone got injured because you know that, but I knew the only way I was going to play is if he got injured or he was suspended. And, you know, and I'll be honest with you, I only spent three or four months with Brendan and I wish I had longer with him because he's, he's one of the best I've worked with and I only worked with him for four months. Wow. Like to that. Hmm. And that's, that's me saying that and I never really played for him. Wow. You know, so I think that says a lot about what, the manager he is, the man he is, you know, his coaching ability. And it's no surprise why Leicester are where they are with, with him in charge. Um, you know, I, I hope he stays there because I think he's building something really good. And um, and then you look back and you can see why he did so well with Liverpool. I know the Celtic and people think Celtic's a given, but he still won and he won and he won and he's a winner and he's got this mentality that I feel like Sir Alex had where you have to win in training every day. He's, if, you, if, if you're not on it in training, he's on you. Um, yeah. And I love that. And literally, he won't let anyone slip. One slips down 2 3%, you're getting pulled and you're on your case. And <laughs> he's in training, and that's the way he's got to be. And that's why you've seen the, the, the team, obviously, before um, this pandemic, uh, the position that they're in. Um, maybe they fell short towards the end, you know. And man, the, the amount of work that they do put in, maybe sometimes was a bit leggy. Um, but I feel like you know, with him, him in charge there, the players they've got, 
you know, they, they're going to be up there. And uh, I said, uh, it was time for me to play. I want to play on a Saturday. You know, when you come towards the end of your career, you know, you, 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 I want to be playing on a Saturday and um, don't want to finish and being like, oh, well, I sat on a bench, I trained for the last couple of years. I didn't want my Leicester time to end sour and end mm. bad. You know, I had an unbelievable time. And there's a time you've got to have a chat with yourself and say, listen, it's time to to leave man like Ricardo to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know what I mean? And, and yeah, go and just think, I fucking know. Okay, it's not the Premier League. I wanted it to be the Premier League. It wasn't. But I also had opportunities to go somewhere else. But at the time, I wanted to stay at home in Manchester. Um, was Amiens an option in France? Because there was a lot of talk about that one. Yeah, that got spoke about a lot of places abroad, Turkey. And I just wasn't ready to leave England at the time. And, you know, we've got my little girls in Manchester. And there was a time, mate, where I nearly didn't get signed. Like, you go on so long, you know, when you're a free trend and then the right back slots get taken and um and then obviously there's a few other options I'd said no to and then others field came up and you know they were in a situation and again it was another it was a different kind of test the bottom of the league 10 points off the bottom uh, I've got a lot of friends there Fraser Campbell you know yeah. right there and um spoke to the manager up and coming manager Cowley's yeah yeah who, who who want to go as high up in the game as, as, as they can and you know, they're passionate and they're really good and I think they will. Um, so it was an opportunity to walk into a dressing room now as a senior player. Yeah. We brought to Newcastle, I had Joey Barton, Alan Smith, Kevin Nolan, QPR, again, Joey Barton, Richard Dunn, Bobby Zamor, you know, and then I've now, Leicester, I kind of, we were all together kind of thing and then I've walked, and then for me to walk into this field as, senior player and, and try and help and give my experience and help the team, help the players because at the time, you imagine you've just been relegated with the lowest points ever. You go to the championship, you lose your first eight games. I walked into a dressing room which was flat. Fractured. Yeah. Gone, like mentally yeah. gone and I try my best to keep, you know, bring my experience, get them going, you know, you know, even little, you know, right, lads, let's get together, we'll have a drink. And I'm going back to that. But, you know, they needed, you know, pulling together again. I could see it. Mm. And, you know, we got we got going. And like I said, I think the first seven, eight games, we didn't lose. And I started playing. And, um, and then, you know, it was up and down. But, yeah, no, it's been a different kind of challenge that I've, I've enjoyed, if I'm honest. And um, we're not sure what's happening next season. But, we'll, I'm, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at everything and, and see... See. Yeah, Danny, time has defeated us. You know, we could go on for another two hours. There's so many more questions that I wanted to ask you, but maybe we'll do a part two yeah. because some of the insight you were providing was just top, top, top level. And yeah, yeah we definitely need to do this again. Yeah, and Danny, yeah. I just want to say, like, love for supporting the platform and what you said about, you know, trying to give back to youngsters really touched us, man, because people like you coming on, you know, sharing your stories, it means the world to us, bro. So big up yourself. No, listen, like, keep doing what you're doing. Like you said about the youth, especially now, generation football's in. We're going to be relying on youth now. I think the, the game's changed. You know, there's going to be less money now and it might help us, you know, with, with you know, bringing more players through the ranks and, and helping them because the young lads do need help now with social media and all these things. And um, so, yeah, no, I like, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for having me on and, I like said, hopefully we'll do part two sometime. Definitely love. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Um, if you want to follow us, you can follow us on our Twitter at podcast or TBG, the beautiful game podcast. We're also on Instagram at pod underscore TBG. And we're also on YouTube, the beautiful game podcast. So thank you very much, Danny. Over and out. Peace.